Welcome to Megger's monthly webinar series. Today's topic is Guide to Underground Fault Locating. In this session, we will be discussing the basics of underground fault locating and some best practices that you can use to locate your faults more efficiently in the field. My name is Greg Valdez. I am the Marketing and Communications Manager for Megger North America, and I'll be acting as the moderator for today's presentation. I will be supporting you on any technical issues or questions for our presenter during the session. On the right side of your screen, you will see a control panel that looks similar to this one. You can submit questions at any time during the presentation by typing in the box highlighted in red, and I will read the questions out during the Q&A segments. Uh, you will receive a copy of the presentation afterwards and a link to the recorded session if you want to watch it again later or share it with your colleagues. Remember, you can ask questions at any time during the presentation and I will interject them as we have time. Our presenter, our presenter today is Robert Probst, Application Engineer for Cable Products. Robert is based out of our Dallas office in Texas. Today we are also joined by Henny Ogen. He is our uh, Product Manager out of Valley Forge. He actually is the product manager for our cable products. Thank you for joining us today, and uh, take it away, Robert. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Robert. I'm one of the applications engineers based in Dallas for the cable products. Um, before I start, um, I joined Megger approximately a year ago. So, so far, I had limited field experience this is why I got support by Henning, and I think a lot of you people know Henning. Uh, he is a, uh, an authority figure in cable fault location. So whenever, whenever my limited knowledge is not enough to answer your questions, I will direct it to Henning, and I hope Henning can help me with that. No problem. Okay. Okay. So let's start with the motivation for uh, cable fault location. When there's a fault happening in the field, what is the objective that we are trying to um, address here? And of course, it is to find the fault and then take uh, appropriate measures. The problem with this is it's not a straightforward process. Uh, you're typically under pressure, you have to find it quickly but you also have to find it safely. Nobody should be harmed. And it is not so much a straightforward engineering process or something like that. It is more a troubleshooting process. And for this troubleshooting process, there is no single method that applies to everything that can solve every problem and that can find any fault. So you have to work with a toolbox of various techniques. And the trick is, the solution to the problem is to apply the one method that works and uh, a few of those are outlined in this presentation. Another thing on the, on the agenda, initially I wanted to include a few more methods but due to time restrictions I had to cut some of them out and there, there's probably a possibility in the future to do like a uh, another webinar that is kind of a an advanced uh, fault location webinar uh, covering the techniques we don't have time to cover today. So what we will talk about is uh, on the very left you will see kind of the introduction to the topic and you will realize that the other three boxes that you see, the yellow one, uh, the pink one and the green one is the actual fault location process. So let's start with the gray box on the left. Very important always is safety. Always work as safely as possible. Um, your company probably has rules and um, you always have to comply with those rules. Um, but typically, you cable fault location, you work on a de-energized cable that is to be properly grounded. And there's always sources that can endanger personnel that is working around a cable fault. First of all, you have to make sure that the cable is actually de-energized, so the operating voltage is one of the, the main hazards. There could be risk of backfeed. Uh, it's more and more common that people have generators at home that could backfeed, so this is a, this is a problem. 
then you have induced electromagnetic interference from adjacent circuits or whatever is also in the trench or substation. And of course, the equipment itself uh, is a high voltage equipment, so you have to be careful to use that equipment in a proper way as well. One word for uh, in terms of grounding. Typically, the modern philosophy is that you have a single point grounding, so one system ground only. That means you should always verify that you have a true earth ground and your grounding scheme is not floating. Actually, you think you're grounded, but you're not. So always make sure there's somewhere an, a true earth ground that you, that you choose as, as system ground on a pad mount transformer that would be the ground rod, typically. Then you, on the equipment, you typically have an equip, equipment safety ground that is only there to discharge any energy that is still in the store in the equipment in case of a fault and that the enclosure is not on potential and uh, uh, potentially harming people. Then you have uh, the high voltage return, which connects to the shield. We will get to the cable construction in a second. And you have the actual high voltage connection that typically connects to the conductor of the cable. And you should always establish these things in the order, like when you connect from top to bottom, when you disconnect from bottom to top. So the, the grounds are typically the last thing you want to, you want to uh, take off. Now, in general, talking about cables, to have the, the same language here, a typical construction would be you have a center conductor, um, aluminum in most of the cases. Then you have a semiconductive layer around it that is there to smoothen out the field around the center conductor because the center conductor is made out of strands and it's not a nice even surface and that semicon layer is there to smoothen out the field. So there's no sharp edges uh, or points where uh, the, there could be a high field stress. Then you have the main insulation. Then you have another semicon layer uh, around the main insulation, which should uh, provide a smooth transition from the main insulation into the actual uh, uh, metallic shield or concentric neutral. Some people call it drain wires, or but the me metallic shield, the return, the high voltage return, then is typically surrounded by a, a jacket. There is unjacketed cable, which is a particular problem, but today most of the cables installed are jacketed or should be jacketed at least. Now talking about cable constructions, they come in a, in a unfortunately in a, in a big variety from, we start in the left, uh, this presentation does not really deal with the secondary fault location and the low voltage stuff, but this is what you would typically see on, on low voltage installation installations, the segmented cables. Then in the middle, you have the shielded concentric cable, and this is the main uh, type of construction in the medium and the high voltage uh, world. So you have one conductor, then you have some sort of insulation, and then you have the shield, the stranded uh, concentric neutral or tape shield, as we will see in a minute. And a typical failure mode is a fault between the core and the shield. Just for nomenclature, if you have a fault from the shield uh, to, the, to, the, to the earth, that would be a sh called a sheath fault. Then you have a three-phase version of this very construction. So you have three of those uh, shielded concentric cables in one uh, with, surrounded with filler material and then uh, in a lot of cases an armor around it which is for me me uh, mechanic protection. Uh, for those cables uh, the core to core fault like the face to face fault is unlikely because each cable is surrounded by a uh, uh, concentric sh by a shield uh, and each conductor has its own shield. So the electric field is symmetrical. It's also called a radial field cable. And then on the right, you can see the uh, dominant type of construction for pill cables. And uh, when cable installations were uh, pretty much being 
being conceived as as electrical connections. So this is pretty much the oldest way of constructing a cable. You have three conductors, but they only have one common shield. And then that leads to certain problems. The field is not symmetrical, so the stress is not distributed symmetrically. And uh, here you can have various different scenarios also for the fault, uh, which can be a face-to-face and, uh, but as I said, this is predominantly the, uh, the, for the laminated cables, for the pilled cables. And uh, so this doesn't really apply for extruded cables. So for everybody who's not familiar with that, uh, what do I mean by this? Like typically uh, extruded cables, this is plastic cables. And you have two main types. You have the EPR type. Uh, ethylene propylene rubber and you have the XLPE, the cross-linked polyethylene. And to the right you can see the pill cables. This is laminated insulation. It's uh, completely different, a completely different type of uh, constructing an insulation, while on the left this is actual solid uh, dielectric. The, the pilk is layers of paper impregnated with oil and fault location on those cables is much different and these cables are typically used in downtown networks while the two uh, or the plastic cables the extruded cables are typically used in so-called URD systems or in general in just standard distribution systems So on the left, you can see uh, this is these three pictures that you have here. Uh, you can see just different types of neutrals. So you have a stranded neutral, that means it's like separate wires. Then you have a tape shield in the middle, which is uh, literally a tape instead of concentric, uh, instead of wires. And the unjacketed, that's a, that's a problem. There, the neutral is exposed to the elements because there's no jacket around it. And um, certain fault location methods can get into trouble with this because it's it's not so easy. Robert, okay, now, okay. Now I see the pictures, okay, good. Okay. Oh, okay, there was a delay. Yeah, there was a delay to, to bring up the two uh, pictures. Maybe okay. you just wanna give a little time to for everyone to, everyone to see it on that previous slide. <clears throat> okay, one second. Yeah. So it's visible now for you? Yeah. Okay. As I said, on the left you can see the, the wires, actual wires. Then you have the tape in the middle and the unjacketed cable. Um, I only found like a picture, uh, not so much an illustration. And what you see there, this grace, that this is the corrosion of the actual uh, neutral. And this stuff can actually corrode away. It can be literally eaten away by the elements, by chemical reactions in the soil, and that can cause problems. Just speaking in general, so we have an understanding what we're actually talking about here. When people say, for instance, 15 kV cable, everything in the power industry is always rated three-phase. Nameplates, it's typically referring to three-phase. So that means this 15 kV is actually a system voltage. That means it is a face-to-face -face voltage. Now, if you have a cable fault and only one phase is faulted and the other two uh, cables are not, then um, the, the problem there is each individual cable does not see the 15 kV, even though it's referred to it as 15 kV cable. Because the, the conductor and the the potential difference is between the conductor and the neutral, the return. Now, if you have face-to-face, -face, that is 15 kV. The actual cable is only, the, the main insulation of each individual cable is only exposed to square root three less. That means from the, the center conductor to the neutral, a 15 kV cable sees 8.6, at the, at the most, a 25 kV cable, this number is 14.4 kV, and for a 35 kV cable, this is 20.2 kV um, at its max. Uh, there are a lot of utility, uh, a, a lot of utilities uh, or co-ops, they would not even go to the 8.6 kV in, in terms of the 15 kV cable, for instance, they would, their operating voltage would be 7.2, and 
that comes out to less than 15 kV face to face. Now, when you have a fault, you expect that the voltage, when you apply voltage to the cable, that this breakdown voltage, as we call it, is lower than this operating voltage because whatever made the cable fail the night before, the day before, the week before, you expect this to be less because it should be it, it should have been good for the operating voltage. And there is another thing that is related to this to this problem is the in, in, insulation thickness, because as we will see, certain methods rely on the ability to actually create a flash over artificially at the fault location uh, to find to locate the fault. And the air gap distance, that means the distance between the conductor and the neutral can can play a role in that. Now, um, just a few things that determine the behavior of the cable, or what what makes the cable uh, what makes the cable work. So the cable has a capacitance. That capacitance is proportional to a few parameters. I would call it uh, physical mechanical design parameters. So this. Um, the epsilon that you see here, that's a typical abbrevi abbreviation for the, for the material of the main insulation. For XLPE, this is typically 2.3 or 2.4. Of course, the length is uh, uh, important for the capacitance. And then also the capacitance is inversely proportional to the, to the different radiuses that you can find there. So the outer to the inner. So the inner would be here, the, the conductor, and the outer would be uh, the actual thickness of the, of the main insulation. And you can see it's not a nice number. There's some uh, crazy math there. And that only pretty much determines that if you would plot the, the field strength and the voltage distribution starting from the center conductor to the neutral, that this is not linear. It's not a nice straight line in the diagram. Uh, the, the closer you get to the center conductor, the more stress the insulation is actually experiencing. Then we have something that we'll, I will go into detail later, but it's the cable velocity, the velocity of propagation. And the vo velocity V is mainly a function of the, of the material. I will <clears> talk <throat> about this a little, a little in detail later. Just for now, uh, it's just important to understand that different materials uh, and have different cable velocities. So a PILC cable, for instance, has a different uh, propagation velocity than an XLPE or an EPR. And then we have the impedance. Now, don't be scared by the math uh, in, ca in case you're not a math guy. This is pretty much uh, important later for some of the uh, pre-location methods. The impedance is determined by two things mainly. There's a material influence, which is the resistance, so you cannot, flee, you cannot flee the resistance of the cable, and then the quality of the insulation, that is what's in that G. But uh, take a look at this L and at this C. These things are predominantly, this is a, a geometric uh, um, quantity. So the inductance and the capacitance, as it is called, this is completely determined by the geometry. And we can use this effect later on when we uh, want to do TDR measurements. Oh. So now let's talk about faults. So there is, you can classify the faults into uh, mainly by the resistance. Uh, but I wanted to take a little bit of a more practical approach. So the most common fault in typical medium voltage cables is a pinhole fault. It's a high resistance fault that is at least in the kilo ohms. What you would expect on the breakdown voltage, remember uh, I was talking about this a, a few slides ago, let's say on the 15 kV cable with this 8.6 max, you would expect this to be lower, and typical values that, that we see in the field is 4 to 8 kV. So by, you know, from, from, a, from a physical view, this means the center conductor is still continuous, so there, it's not severed or anything. It's still, it's still all the way there, and it does not have uh, any contact 
physical contact with the concentric neutral, but there's a hole in the insulation. And that made the, the cable, the, the cable, or that was the result of the cable failing of that blowout that happened. There's another um, fault, it's an open conductor, and that pretty much means the conductor was either severed, like it, it, it was torn apart, uh, or it burned open. The problem with, with this is, uh, and we will get into this, what all these abbreviations mean, uh, a TDR or a radar cannot see beyond this point because it relies on the ability to have, uh, to actually use the, the conductor and the return to, to measure certain parameters, parameters of the cable. And uh, you may also not be able to use the, uh, what's called the arc reflection method, especially if that, if that gap is too wide so you cannot uh, make it flash over. And the typical solution in the, in the practical world would be, okay, if you limit it to this point, just go to the other end of the cable, because typically the cables, as we discussed, isolated, grounded, stood off, parked. So you can go to the other side and try your fault location techniques from the other side and hope, you know, to learn, to learn more. And then we have a short, this typically happens when uh, the center conductor and the concentric neutral, when they are in direct contact, this could also uh, be by uh, metal pieces. And the example would be somebody um, installed a ground rod somewhere or a stop sign was uh, installed and so they hit a cable. And then because they go right through the cable, the center conductor and the neutral are touching pretty much. They have a, an electrical connection. And these are low resistance, very low res resistance faults, 10 ohms, 100 ohms typically. The problem also with those faults is I just want to mention it. Since it's a, it's a short, you will later see that there's no possibility to create a flash over there, a spark. And so you also cannot use really the, the arc reflection method on, on those faults. Now, when I said URD, because this uh, abbreviation was uh, mentioned a couple of times now, URD stands for Underground Residential Distribution. And um, when, you, when you think about what I tried to describe earlier with the plastic and the, the pill cables, every, everything that is in downtown networks with these lead cables, the, the, uh, laminate, the laminated cables, is pretty much the opposite of URD cables. So URD cables are typically XLPE or EPR, while downtown is mainly PIL. Um, the system voltages that we have in the US here are 15, 25, and 35. The uh, kind of network type that you find in the, in the utility world and in the distribution world here is loop feeds or sometimes radial feeds. That means you have like from one point it goes uh, radially from that point, or you have a loop with a normally open point. So you have access from two sides at least. Typically, those are single phase cables. Um, and that was the, in, in that overview with the five different uh, construction types, the one in the middle, the, the pretty much the easiest kind of. You have one center conductor, main insulation, and, and a return. So URD systems, therefore, are what you can call, it's a point A to point B um, network or connection and you rarely see branches, maybe a T-splice here and there, but downtown networks are typically, there's, it's a branch network. Um, so the URD systems are ideal for radar or TDR based technologies because there is no, uh, no problems with the signals being split up into, into, the brand, into the branches. Also compared to any downtown network, URD systems are generally easy to access and fairly easy to isolate. The main failure mode for plastic cables, as it turned out uh, over the decades, are so-called water trees. That means there's uh, concentrations of, um, of water within the solid insulation, and at a certain point they will cause uh, stress and uh, electrical trees, and those electrical trees, they will, they will grow forward at a very high rate and then make the cable 
fail. And the typical failure mode is, since this happens very punctually, like very locally, is that the cable blows out and you have these pinhole faults. For your D networks, you can get away with kind of portable thumpers. You do not need big van mounted systems most of the time. And the typical approach to, to fix those systems is you have to fault locate and then once you have your fault location, you dug up the cable, you repair it, then you test it, and then you rebury it. While in downtown networks, that is not so easy. You have conduit um, and the oil uh, impregnated insulation, is, it's a different animal entirely. So we're, we're talking URD systems here. If you are interested in fault location in branch networks, um, Mr. Derek Smith, the area sales manager for the East Coast uh, for the cable products at Megger, he did a, a webinar fairly recently solely on uh, fault location on downtown and branch networks. So you may want to go there if you're interested on the other side uh, and when you want to see what the differences are between the URD and the, the downtown networks. So what is the fault location sequence? As I said, the, the three boxes are here again. So what I called here on the left pretty much the checks is what you do when you arrive and you want to learn what the actual situation is. Um, by, to, by today's philosophy, probably the, the uh, and not so, let's say, uh, systematical approach would be just to get the, the search generator, the thumper out and start thumping the cable, searching the cable and, and hoping for the best. Today we have uh, so many more tools and all these tools are made to help you to make your life easier as a fault locator, so why not use these tools? And since fault location is also a troubleshooting process, your toolbox must consist of various tools and if you use them nicely, with every with every tool you gain some information that helps you to make a conclusion and finally to fall to find a fault much easier so we have some checks which is insulation resistance then a high pot then uh, maybe maybe tracing the cable even though that is recommended not necessary if you have good maps and you feel confident then we have the big block of pre-location and within the pre-location we find the radar, the TDR, then the art reflection methods and then other methods which are more complicated. And once you're done with the pre-location, the pre-location gives you an approximate distance to the fault in, in like very high accuracy plus minus one percent in, in that range but it, you you never would dig a hole just based on the pre-location so then the actual location the pinpointing takes place and you you use what a lot of people are familiar with uh, out there you have a thumper and they use some sort of pinpointing device um, with the thumper together to actually pinpoint the fault so what are the, the checks? Insulation resistance, uh, particularly helpful to just to get an idea of what is going on and to, to get an idea on the resistance of the fault. So do we have like a low resistance fault, a high resistance fault, low resistance fault could indicate a short or a, a near short, high resistance a pinhole fault. These things you can find out with an insulation test. If you have a three-phase cable in, in one uh, um, in, in one jacket, you could do face-to-face -face checks to find out if there's something going on like this. So it's a, it's a very uh, basic measurement that can already tell you a lot. So then you can do what a lot of people refer to a HIPAA test, but it's not like a classical HIPAA test. Before I came to Mega, I worked at a high power lab, and uh, so a high pod has different meanings in different worlds. So here we're talking about it is a verification test for breakdown and to determine the breakdown voltage. It's not a test, it's not a withstand test, it's not a pressure test. So what we can gain, we can find out can the cable hold voltage. If, if not, then you're probably on the correct cable, or at least you are on a faulted cable. Then you can see, is there a short? How do you see this with that kind of test? 
well if the if the voltage is not building up and you see a lot of leakage that indicates that there is a, a, a fairly low resistance somewhere on the cable that also determines can I use the most popular uh, pre-location method, the arc reflection method, or not. In certain fault configurations, you cannot use the arm. It's just not working physically. And of course, you determine the actual breakdown voltage, which later is uh, important because all the high voltage techniques that you are using are based on that value because you have to exceed that value to actually make the method work. And of course, as I said, as a recommended step, you can trace the cable. But if you are confident that your maps are accurate, and there's no surprises waiting for you, it's, it's not a, um, a must-have. So pre-location, we're in that pink box. What is pre-location? Typical methods are TDR, then you have the arc reflection method, which there is a few of those nowadays. Then you have uh, bridges, um, which unfortunately I had, to, I had to leave out of the presentations of the presentation, so I cannot really say anything to that, but ju just to give you uh, an idea, uh, bridges are typically for the faults where you cannot use the arc reflection methods and you cannot use the TDR, so they fill a specific niche and the, the pretty much the, the, the territory in between a very low resistance fault and, the, and, and a high resistance fault that cannot address with uh, the arc reflection method. And then there are other methods like for instance the ICE method or the DK method that is all pre-location. So let's start with the TDR. What does TDR mean? TDR means time domain reflectometry. And as the name says, it is a technique that works in the time domain. That means the instrument starts and stops clocks and measures reflections. It sends pulses into the cable and it, it interprets reflections based on a in the time domain so it's not in the frequency domain or in some other in, in some other qu uh, quantity it is times so you start a clock and you stop a clock it is usually a low voltage high frequency pulse we're talking 20 to 30 volts there's only one exception to that there's one arc reflection method which use, utilizes a pulse that can be a thousand or fifteen hundred volts in that range but that is the only exception it's typically a low voltage pulse and in terms of physics the TDR works based on I have two parallel conductors and I send the pulse down and uh, just to clarify this the actual electromagnetic pulse that that pulse that travels down the cable travels between those two conductors so these conductors are too far away your 20 30 volts they get diminished so you don't you don't see much that's one problem you so you need a, a fairly close return conductor to make that work and um so the pulse travels in between and it travels at the wave uh, propagation or uh, velocity of propagation so this is what I what I mentioned before for different materials the values can be different and as I said before this L and the C in that formula of the of the cables impedance are purely defined by the geometry of the cable this is the same for the for the inductance and the capacitance of an overhead line and it's very much true for a cable so the, the distance between those two conductors in terms of our single phase cable which is the center conductor and the concentric neutral is proportional to its impedance so the TDR by sending down those signals high frequency signals will give you an impedance fingerprint of the cable with a low voltage measurement and today's TDRs are much more in, evolved than 20, 30 years ago and they can visualize actually that trace which is way more important than actually just giving you uh, a footage like a, a distance, a numerical value, A, your cable end is somewhere there because with the visuals the, the uh, the human brain is very good in pattern recognition and when you see something when you can visualize this impedance footprint you can gain a lot of additional informations 
So what kind of signatures do we have? So you look on your screen, so you connect the one lead of the TDR to the center conductor, the other lead to the, to the return. If there's no change in impedance, that means there's nothing going on with the condition of the uh, center conductor and the neutral, it's a flat line. If you have an, a high impedance situation suddenly, for instance, the distance between the two conductors are widening or you hit the end of the cable, you will see an upward signature, an upward bump. If you have a low impedance situation, a short, or the distance between the conductor and the concentric neutral is decreasing, you will see a downward signature. And since there's Cables are made out of reels with uh, a finite length. Cables are spliced together, so there is a signature for splices. Transformers look the same, and you can see this is this uh, this S shape I have put on the on the bottom of your screen. So that is kind of an indication for a splice or a transformer. Now, how does this look in real life? This is a, a real life trace, and you can see. In front, you have some distortion. This is called the characteristic hookup impedance because you have leads. The distance between the two leads change until you are actually connected to the cable, and this is reflected by this uh, kind of uh, wave shape to the left. And then nothing happens pretty much. One third to the uh, from the left, if you can see that there is a small signature, that would be uh, a splice. This flat S shape, so there's a splice most likely. And then nothing happens to that cable, it's a flat line, and at the end you have this big upward signature, and the algorithm in the TDR puts a flag there and, and tells, tells you, you the cable's open at 550 feet. Now the thing with this is, you can have several systematic errors in there. If you have the wrong cable velocity, then this number will be, will be off. So very important, and this is why I mentioned it's a troubleshooting process, it's not like you hook it up and a magic box is doing the cable fault location for you, that just doesn't exist. It is important that you have an expectation when you go out there. If you kn know the cable is a thousand feet long and the TDR tells you 980, does this meet your expectation? or does it, does it not? Is it close to the thousand feet or do you have a very exotic fault that is right there at 980, there's an, uh, an open conductor or something like that and you don't actually see the physical end of the cable. But you know, 980, 990 out of a thousand, that, that sounds pretty good as a, as a first approximation. So you have to have an expectation. You cannot make these uh, processes go smoothly when you do not know what you're dealing with. So if you know the cable is a thousand feet long and this, for instance, you get this trace and it tells you the open is 549, then uh, you pretty much already found like one of your faults because it, you know it's a thousand feet long and uh, the TDR indicates otherwise. Um, speaking of the cable velocity, the the pulse that the TDR is sending out is traveling at a percentage of the speed of light because there's a solid dielectric, and um, which is 60 to 70 percent of the speed of light, and a typical value for plastic cables would be 255 feet per microsecond. This is one number. For PILC, it's li a little less, maybe in the 230s or something like that. Um, the velocity is mainly uh, affected by the insulation material, material. And also some other manufacturers, uh, um, other parameters like for instance the, the, manuf the conductor size, because that all affects the geometry. See for, for medium voltage cables, 255 is a good is a good starting point unless you know otherwise if you have, if you actually know you have a, a certain type of cable in there and you have manufacturer information you obviously dial in whatever the manufacturer rates its own cable now let's go to the arc reflection method so with the TDR uh, you get a impedance footprint of the cable and it allows you to a certain extent to identify 
uh, low impedance faults because you have this downward blip that indicates a short or at least a very low impedance, so you get away with that. But as soon as the fault is uh, larger than a, f a few hundred ohms, then a TDR will not be able to see faults like that. A typical pinhole fault, this low voltage pulse is not enough to bridge the air gap from the center conductor to the concentric neutral. So you have the, it is, the TDR is blind for pinhole faults, just the TDR by itself. Now there's a method of utilizing the TDR in a way to actually see the position of the fault and to give you a distance to the fault. And this is called the art reflection method. Today this is a group of methods because there's obviously development on that end. And, but in general all of these methods have a few things in common. You have a high voltage source, you have some sort of filter, you have the TDR that is uh, uh, within uh, is in that circuit for visual visualization and for measurements and you hook this combination up to a cable and then you execute the arm and the arm is a two-step process so you combine a low voltage uh, signal with a high voltage uh, surge you record two traces and you overlay those two traces. The first trace is the low voltage trace purely from the TDR, from the radar, and then you discharge your high voltage source into the cable and you record a measurement of that and you overlay those two and the point where the two traces are deviating, this is the location of your fault. So what role plays the high voltage pulse here? The high voltage pulse creates an electric arc at the fault position, which sparks and then turns into a, a kind of weak electric arc. And the TDR is constantly sending out pulses, and these pulses are bouncing back from that arc that wasn't there before. And because that arc, there's a current flow, uh, related to this and it is a very low impedance situation this is a, it's almost it's a short there's it's an arc there's two two uh, electrodes two different parts of your cable that should not be at the same potential now are almost at the same potential so the TDR will record a downward blip a downward bump and with the overlay of those two traces you will you can actually calculate the distance to the fault now how does this look? Let's uh, take a look at our cable and we have a fault somewhere. So you have the beginning of the cable, you have the end, the physical beginning and the end, and there's this fault location somewhere that we don't know yet. So you do your low voltage TDR trace, your reference measurement, and you will get something like that. The TDR is blind for the pinhole fault, it sees the end of the cable. Now you discharge your uh, high voltage source into the cable which creates that red trace and those two traces are hugging each other. The moment when the high voltage surge reaches the pinhole fault, it will flash over, uh, create this downward signature, you overlay these in software and the software will calculate the distance to the fault and this is how you actually pre-locate that type of fault. So real traces look a little bit like this. So on the on the very top, you have a, a typical uh, pinhole fault. So the the traces are pretty much not exactly, but they're very close to each other, hugging, especially in the beginning. And then you have this sharp V-shape signature, downward signature, and this is and the computer flagged it at at 7,990 feet. There's your flashover, and this is where your cable fault is. Now on the on the bottom you have a different different type of fault and uh, this is a fault right at the end of the cable that it would look like that so the traces are hugging each other um, perfectly and and then at the at the at the fault they will deviate and this is where you where you will find your fault. Oh, Robert, we had a quick question I wanted to throw in there while I get a chance. Um, the question is, what does the runtime factor of a TDR refer to? The the runtime of a TDR? Uh, the question is, what does the runtime factor 
of a TDR refer to? The runtime factor. Um, I'm not really familiar with that with that expression. Is uh, are we referring to the cable velocity here? I don't know. May maybe Henning has to help me for the first time today. Well, well I, I think uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. I would I would think it has to do with the cable velocity uh, because it's really the the fact that that the pulse travels along the cable. I think that would be my interpretation. Typically, people refer to as velocity, but propagation velocity, but I think runtime factor is pretty much the same because it, it tells you how long it takes for the pulse to run back and forth on the on the on you know on your cable. So I I would agree with you. It's cable velocity, I think that's what it's referring to. Okay. So let's go to this uh, filter problem real quick. So why do we have a filter there? And uh, the reason for this is uh, you have the, uh, the high voltage source, which is pretty much a capacitor. You charge the capacitor, and then you, you run this energy through a, a filter. So why is that? That was the last of the, of the uh, bullet points on this, on this other slide. So why do you do this? The reason is you want to maximize the chance that one of the radar pulses is actually hitting that arc when it's standing there, when it's burning there, for only a few milliseconds. And so you can actually see where the fault occurs. These TDRs that are involved in fault location are not your typical handheld TDRs. Those are triggered TDRs. So now if you think about the longer the cable gets, the more this, uh, the runtime differences between like the TDR pulse and the actual discharge of the high voltage source can, can become a problem. So the, the TDR has to be timed very precisely to actually hit the standing arc uh, to, to reflect back. There's a few different ways to do that. The, the most primitive one is a passive resistive filter. So you just have a resistor in, in line with your source and, and you can see the, uh, where it says surge voltage, the steep, almost needle, that is what the high voltage source, the, the surge generator, the thumper is putting out. With the resistive filter, you're already extending the time then you have a semi-active uh, uh, way of doing that and you have a, a coil, an inductor there, which already extends the time the, the arc is present at the fault. And then you have a, tec a technique where you actually discharge an additional capacitor on top of your main capacitor and that would be considered active. And uh, people refer to this as um, double surging. And one vari variation of that is uh, the ARM plus. So there you can see why there is a filter for the arc reflection method actually. It is to, sh to make it possible to actually gain uh, a good radar reflection from the fault position. Now let's uh, summarize. Um, for the, the, with the pre-location, you try to learn a few things. First of all, the distance to the end of the cable. And when you are not sure about the distance, uh, or the, when you're not sure that you actually have the physical end of the cable, what you can always do, hopefully, is that you uh, send somebody down to the other end of the cable, if it's, if it's, um, if it's doable, and physically short the main the conductor and the concentric neutral, neutral together, and the live TDR trace should go from an upward signature to a downward signature because you go from an open end to a dead short, and the TDR indicates these with different signatures. So if you're not sure if you have the actual end of the cable, you can always verify by physically making that connection uh, so you actually find the end of the cable. Because this is very important, to find the end of the cable is one of your main priorities when you want to attack these problems. Because as we had in this uh, example before, the cable is 1,000 feet long and the TDR flags it at 550 open end. What is going on there? So a way to verify is, if possible, short the two, uh, short the two at the end together, the conductor and the concentric neutral, and see if the TDR trace changes. That already tells you a lot. So with the distance to the end of the cable, what you pretty much want to do is you want to eliminate any awkward situations, surprises. You really want to know in what can, what, with what type of fault you are dealing with. 
you will get by the using the arm methods a distance to the fault so it will actually tell you fault this far out from where you are and you can also gain additional information um, which could be like um, a webinar by itself for like to to count or um, to actually to identify it's a better word to identify splices and transformers so you can use the arc reflection method it's a very powerful tool for sectionalizing actually because you get the distance to the fault and it puts you between two transformers and then you know which segment of the of your cable to isolate to sectionalize now when we have this pre-location and it's fairly accurate um, why do we have to do pinpointing at all and here is what I already uh, mentioned before the velocity of propagation the cable velocity can be a systematic error in your in your doing if you have the wrong velocity you can be off and uh, to actually dug a hole uh, not being sure where the fault actually is that is a that is gambling uh, you can also uh, the the cable path uh, is of importance because the TDR gives you a distance of the fault if you don't if the cable is not following the actual path let's say classic example is uh, you the the crew things you're standing at a pad mount transformer the cable runs down on your side of the road to the next pad mount while in reality it crosses the street to the left runs on the left on the other side of the road and comes back uh, under the under the asphalt under the pavement back to the other pad mount now then the distance is correct but it's physically at a different spot because the the layout of the cable is different and also the problem uh, why you have to do pinpointing is you always have the possibility uh, the nasty situation that you have multiple faults on the same cable therefore you do you apply a process that is typically referred as thumping and you assist the thumper by uh, using a pinpoint device so just if somebody is not familiar thumping what is thumping you have a high voltage uh, uh, source a surge generator or thumper you charge up a capacitor in that high voltage uh, source and you discharge it abruptly by closing a switch into the cable and this is a very high voltage high frequency high energy pulse and that travels down the cable in this case it is not filtered as before while the arc reflection the pre-location is filtered uh, the thumper or the thumping is done at the the uh, an unrestricted energy level so to speak and if you would demonstrate this in in air you have a short cable and you do an arc reflection to demonstrate this to an audience and then you do a thumb while the arc reflection is only uh, a kind of weak sizzling the thumb is actually like a gunshot so it's it's really loud and there's it's it's actually really powerful so what does this uh, pulse do well it travels um, to the fault position there it flashes over this is why it's important to have to thump at a voltage above your uh, formerly um, learned breakdown voltage otherwise it won't flash over it will it will the thump will flash over there and this creates sound noise and also an electromagnetic field is surrounded by this electric uh, or the electric discharge is surrounded by an electromagnetic field and you can use this actually for a very accurate uh, pinpointing so when we're talking surge energy because if you look up any specs thumpers are always one of the main specs is the energy so why is that <coughs> uh, energy is measured in joules and that is watt seconds and joules equals equal noise um, the threshold for actually hearing a surge in the ground is typically 300 to 400 joules and you it is very unlikely that you will pick up anything if you have insufficient levels of energy um, and the typical a typical value for your D cables your your um, 
you would be doing very well if your thumper has a thousand or fifteen hundred joules. Now the surge energy of the thumper, um, as I as I uh, wrote there, is proportional to the capacitance C and to the square of the voltage. This has certain implications for the practical application of those thumpers. Back in the days, um, and a pri primary example of that was uh, always Biddle, they had huge uh, thumpers, uh, insane energy levels, but they, they were only single stage. Modern thumpers are typically multi-stage, and the reason is to provide a high energy at various different voltage levels. Because if you, let's say, have a thumper that can go up to 16 kV and 16 kV only, there is no lower stage, you will only get your maximum energy at that voltage. Now, because the energy goes with the square of the voltage and not just with the voltage, if you thump at 8 kV instead of the full 16, you cut your energy, uh, the energy will be a quarter not half, it will be a quarter. That means the lower you go, the less chances you have to create noise. And this is the reason for the introduction of multi-stage thumpers, which are standard today. So you have choices. And one uh, very practical choice, always thump at the lowest possible voltage to get the maximum energy out of it. Um, of course, you still have to make it flash over, and if you are above the rating of, a, of one of the stages, <clears throat> well, then you can't help it. But if you have a multi-stage thumper, let's say 8 kV and 16 kV, it flashes over at 7, be in the 8 kV stage to actually utilize more energy. Don't be in the 16 kV stage because 7 is even less than, a ha than half of 16, so you, you will drastically diminish the energy you can pump into the fault to create noise. Why is the creation of uh, noise a problem? Um, or why are we doing this? Because the pinpointing devices can pick up either on the sound or the electromagnetic ma magnetic field. So the noise is pretty much, or the thump is the, the, your, your, the, the source of what you can pick up then to pinpoint the fault. Another um, thing I just want to mention real quick is the capacitance. Typically the thumper has to be sized prob uh, properly to be able to actually charge the cable and the typical rule of thumb there is that you, um, that the thumper has to be five to ten times the capacitance of the cable you want to thump to really make sure you have enough energy to dump into the cable. Because as we saw before, the cable is mainly a capacitor and you, you have to charge the cable. If you're not able to do that, then you will run into problems if your thumper is too small. Now, pinpointing devices. Uh, why are we doing that? Technically, you could just thump with a high energy and you can thump for hours or days. Whatever. And uh, you can just walk along the cable until somebody picks up the noise somehow. Well, this is not a, a, you know, a preferred way of doing that because these uh, thumps are done at uh, uh, typically at a fairly high voltage, so the longer you stress the cable, you risk of getting into something. So the pinpointing device actually reduces the uh, <coughs> time that you, that you need to be surging. So from your pre-location, you already know, you have an idea of plus minus 1% where the cable uh, fault, where the fault is located. You walk in the proximity of that, um, you tell your crewman to turn on the thumper, you uh, bring your pinpointing device and you will find the, the fault fairly quickly and there's no need of thumping away, thumping around for hours. Um, older methods were purely acoustic and the problem with that is that if you, as soon as you run into concrete or different soil material where the, the, sound, the sound waves are propagating at a different speed, or in very noisy environments right next to a road is a classic example, you can run into problems there. So the, the method of choice today is the so-called coincidence method or um, simplified called, uh, simply called the thunder and lightning. And it's the same idea. The electric discharge that the thumper creates is your lightning strike. And since the electromagnetic field travels way faster than the sound, you can pick up 
the electromagnetic field with the coil first, and then you can detect the first sound uh, that travels through the soil or the concrete, the pavement, whatever. And then you can compare those two, and you then you can calculate um, um, uh, a delay, and then you go a few uh, feet ahead towards the, the assumed fault, and then the pinpointing device will indicate to you, hey, did you get closer or did you get further away? And uh, for, for, for that purpose, you can uh, uh, get to the fault fairly quickly, and since these coincidence devices, they are based on the first sound. They also don't get fooled by um, conduits because the the ends of the conduit is typically where the largest, the, the biggest noise is that a human would run to, but the computer cannot be tricked with an algorithm like that. Um, so here we have, you can see on this illustration there how it actually works. So there is a search generator, a thumper. It's hooked up. Uh, the, the pulse travels down, so the, the red is the electromagnetic field, and then there you have the noise that is created at the at the fault, and you can pick it up with your with your um, uh, pinpointing device. Now this is a one of the examples that, for instance, Mega has at the Digifone Plus um, is uh, pinpoint is for uh, it's the uh, pinpointing device. Uh, well, this is the last slide now uh, on the on the topic. I just want to say something about burning because I run into this uh, question or this thing fairly often. Burning, uh, just to clarify this, burning is a technique that was invented for pill cables, for paper insulated uh, lead covered cables for the laminated insulations. Um, the reason is when you try to create an arc, the oil uh, is, is, is moving particles, so it's really hard to uh, ignite and sustain an arc in conditions like that. So what you try to do with the, with the burning is to, you try to condition your fault. You try to uh, carbonize the fault location. You uh, carbonize, you, you change the chemical properties of the oil, and you create a carbon path, like a track. And therefore, the resistance of the fault is reduced, and then you can use the arc reflection method. You displace the oil, um, you uh, introduce carbon, uh, you reduce the resistance, therefore, and then you can apply the arc reflection method. Uh, and therefore, this is a typical pilk uh, uh, fault locating technique. It is not it is on plastic cables, it is, it is really your last stand because it can actually really harm your cable. Uh, it will heat up your cable that uh, a large amount of current that is also there for a long amount of time can actually melt the insulation at a certain point and then your conduct, your concentric is actually trying to uh, you know, slowly uh, wander towards the, the conductor and if you're lucky, you create a situation where your TDR can pick it up or uh, where you have a, uh, the chance of thumping, but where do you stop? You don't know where to stop. So in most of the cases when people try to burn plastic cables, they, they literally burn it like to death. They burn it open, they carbonize it into, uh, into a condition where it's really hard then to, to go on with uh, actual fault location. So be very careful with burning. It's a typical uh, conditioning technique. You want a permanent conversion of your fault uh, for laminated cables, not for uh, extruded cables. So uh, what has Megger to offer? Just uh, a few things. On the left, you can see some radars, TDRs. Then uh, we have on, on the left lower corner, it's the Easy Thumb. It's a, um, a small thumper, 12 kV system. In the middle, you see one of the, the bigger units, a 16 kV dual stage thumper, 1500. <laughs> Uh, joules and on the right, then you can see uh, a system that is 
probably more um, convenient for downtown network fault location. Uh, this is an SWG3500, so you have a surge generator and additional capacitor to provide you more energy. On the right, you can see the filter that we talked about for arc stabilization, and on top you can see the radar. This is a, a, a heavy, a typical van-mounted system uh, with very, very high energies that you need in those downtown networks or for, for pill cables. And um, if you want to know more about the, the product line, this um, uh, link will help you. And the uh, another thing that I can suggest um, looking into is a, an integrated van uh, system. For instance, here the, the Centrix 2.0. These can be configured for diagnostic purposes, but also for fault location purposes or for both. Like, for instance, this van has both. Um, and uh, so then you can, you can have all kinds of, this is pretty much an entire toolbox integrated with one software and one interface that can do fault location and diagnostics. That is the very high end, the flagship solution, the, the so-called the so -called all in one solution that this is an actual toolbox that will provide you every, every method that there is to, to be able to handle uh, cable faults or to, to do diagnostics. And uh, that was that. And um, thank you for watching.